So what, what, what God calls us into uh, when he calls us to himself, come and be my friend. Mm. A life of faith is a life of friendship. Friendship, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's not a transaction that you do at one time and then you set it aside until one day you die and you go to heaven. Mm. But it, it's a friendship that you have with God all along. Welcome to the Soul Renovate Podcast, where longtime friends George and Jim discuss spiritual formation, soul care, and how Christian leaders can grow in abiding in Christ. Over the next several weeks, Jim and George are talking about friendship. What is it really, and why is it so important to our walks with Jesus? Let's dive in. Good morning, George. Hey, good morning, Jim. Well, we're in episode three of our friendship series. Seems like we're getting in to the heart of it today. Yep. We're going to really jump into the scripture a little more. And, uh, you know, last year uh, with Renovate, we both in our retreats that we do quarterly and our learning cohorts, we gave almost our full attention to friendship with God. In this series, we're, we're looking at friendship in general, but given some focus to the friendships that we have, mm-hmm. you and I have, but we have with other people, but we're not going to shy away from wading into our friendship with God as well. That's so right. we'll, we'll go in both directions. That's right. Yeah. There's so much overlap. Uh, because it's friendship in the context of spiritual formation and you can't exclude God out of the equation. No, no. <laughs> uh, try, though we may. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned spending the day with Jesus. Could, could you just give us a minute of what that is? Sure. So here in our location, um, which we live in northeast Kansas, yeah, we have every three months or so, we have a one-day retreat. Sometimes when people hear, Retreat. They think several days, and mm-hmm. we've done we've done that as well. But currently, we're we're calling them spending the day with Jesus, mm-hmm. and we give about seven hours at a really nice retreat setting uh, that's north and west of Topeka. Yeah, and um, we really literally spend the day with Jesus. We bring content and some liturgy and some shared experiences. So it's not sitting and listening to someone lecture. Yeah, and there's a time for solitude and silence and quietness and reflection. That's that, right. That's afforded people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when's the next one? Next one is, it's easy to remember, especially if you're a Star Wars fan, it's May the 4th. Oh, So okay. Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. That's right. Yeah. So come be with us. On yeah. May the 4th. Yeah. And uh, we'd love to have you. And you can go to, since we're giving the shameless plug, we just say you can go to our website, soulrenovate.us, and you'll find it there. I think it's under the events tab, yeah. but it, it's not hard to find. Yeah, yeah. You can register there. If you have more information, reach out and let us know. Yeah. Let you know. I, I want to say friends retreat together. I think that's, if, if you have a couple of friends that... You want to come together and build spiritual formation into your friendships? That would yeah. be an excellent way to do it. That's great. Mm. That Yeah, my, I have my son. He has these friends that he retreats with oh, really? uh, on an annual basis. Mm. And they come from all over the country because they're yeah. living. They're scattered now. Uh, he graduated college maybe a dozen years or so ago. And... Uh, and they come from wherever they agree on a meeting place and spend three or four days. And so I think retreat. That's a great practice. Like it becomes like a pilgrimage. I remember John Orberg talking about that in his on his podcast, Become New. He has yeah. several, at least more, one group, but but I think he's got more that that he retreats with um, on a yearly basis. And yeah, yeah. It's I think it's a great practice. Mm-hmm. My son's friends, they call themselves the guard. They the have guard. they have a name for it. Yeah. And uh, and it's really important yeah. for each of them. So friendship. Um, we're gonna go on this journey together, continuing it. And as I've as we've now gotten into this, it's something I'm thinking about more and more, not just 
thinking about in terms of getting ready for the next Mm -hmm. conversation, but just personal reflection. And I'm not going to get into all that now. Maybe share that along the way, some of those reflections. But it's already been really helpful, and Mm -hmm. it's, it's helping me understand my own journey in friendship. Uh, more, and uh, the 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 conversations that I'm hearing, Jim, are really alarming to me. In that, for a lot of adults, many adults, and you know, we can throw in statistics here, but they say most statistics are made up on the spot, and it's probably true. I, I just can't remember the numbers, but but most. Many adults do not have a deep friendship mm. with another person. Yeah. And uh, that statistic, uh, that reality, that fact, has doubled and quadrupled over the last few years. Wow. So I think mm. I, would, I would say there's a crisis of friendship yeah. in in the church, in society in general, but... But in the church as well, there's a crisis of friendship. And I think one of our missions at Renovate is to make friendship the normal way of doing relationships with other people yeah. in the church and in life. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. <clears throat> I think I've, I've noted that in, in a lot of my conversations, a lot of times what people interpret from their life as the good old days— those days were often characterized by being richer in friendships mm-hmm. than they are currently. Yeah, yeah. It's a meaningful component for them. Mm. So there's so much we can learn about ourselves, and about God and others through this journey, and that's what we want to invite. Unfortunately, we have, we have several examples in the Scriptures that point us in that direction. Yeah, so. we do. And we're going to look at a big one. yeah today. Mm. So we're going to look through the life of a man that if you're even vaguely familiar with the scriptures, you probably have heard of Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, George, you asked me to read this, the kind of the narrative of Abraham in the Old Testament, which is in, begins in the 12th chapter of Genesis, very first book, and then goes along to all the way, technically, to the end of chapter 25. So there's an 12 or 13 or however many chapters that is is given to the story of Abraham. Yeah, that's a lot of space. It's a that's lot, a of, lot space. of space. So my first reading of it, I sat down and read it at once, you know, because I wanted to get a, a feel for the entire story. And to be honest with you, George, like, I was trying to read it without trying to read any, anything into it. I would not say friendship is what immediately jumped out. Mm-hmm. At me, there mm-hmm. were some themes that were seemed evident, but yeah. I wasn't necessarily thinking about friendship that much as I was reading it, yeah. tr- trying to read it with a blank slate. So I have a question for you, mm-hmm. and um, why Abraham? Yeah, what what caused you to? You're, you're the one that brought Abraham into yeah, this yeah. story. So, yeah, why did you think about Abraham? Well, there's, there's three passages in the Bible where Abraham is called a friend of God. And that is not said of anyone else until you get to the New Testament where Jesus now normalizes hmm. friend of God kind of language. But um, in Second Chronicles... Let's see, Second Chronicles 20 and verse 7. And these are people that are writing about their history, and they're remembering God, they're remembering their ancestors. And um, they're calling, they're giving um, a title to Abraham. You, you want to read that? I'm there, yeah. Uh, Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. Uh, I imagine, like, this is Jehoshaphat talking, actually. Uh, He says, Our God 
you drove, so he's speaking to God, evidently, you drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it as a permanent possession to the descendants of your friend Abraham. Yeah. You know, I wonder why did he feel compelled to add that? That. Yeah, that phrase, your that friend. That description, your friend Abraham. He could have said, our ancestor Abraham, he could have said any number of ways, said it in many ways, but, but somehow he wanted to bring and give us a picture that Abraham was a friend of God. Now the question is, and we're going to read a couple more, the question is, on what basis did Jehoshaphat describe hmm. Abraham as a friend of God? Like, what was he reading? What what was he remembering? What's the story of Abraham that he says that must be a story of friendship? Interesting. Because right? you said at the beginning yeah. it doesn't strike you as a story of friendship. No. Well, it is and it isn't. It's a story of God making a covenant with Abraham and all of that stuff. But at some point you have to begin to look at this story as a lot more intimate relationship, what's going on between Abraham and God. Yeah. And when they did that, when they meditated on the scriptures um, and remembered the story of Abraham, the one thing that came to mind is friendship. It's so interesting because, yeah, it's been, I don't really know, you scholars out there would have to help us, I don't know how many hundreds of years it's been between Abraham and Josephat, but it's been a it's been a minute. Yeah. So the 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 this people groups had time to reflect and look back. Where it seems like, in a conversation with God, it just comes out. Yeah. Josephat. Just being curious, like, was there a tradition? Was there a, an oral tradition of talking about Abraham as a friend of God and God being a friend to Abraham? And is that where Jehoshaphat is, has learned it from. Interesting. Did yeah. did his learning, his Hebrew faith, include a section in it? Mm. Abraham as a friend of God, you know? Where would he get it from? You know, obviously the Holy Spirit has inspired him to include that in there. But it must have been something that was not uncommon to think about. Yeah, that's good. Abraham as a friend of God. Yeah, in yeah. some ways. I'm just being curious here, but... Yeah. We don't know exactly how these things right. came about, but when the final canon of Scripture was put together, whatever dates you give to that, and they, they kept these names and words that describe relationship with God, what stuck is Abraham is a friend of God. Yeah. And it's mentioned three times. The other time, I think, is in Isaiah 41, verse 8. Okay. And this is, this is a little bit different. Okay, this is the Lord speaking this time. I'm there. Uh, Isaiah 41, 8. He writes, You, my servant Israel, Jacob, whom I have chosen, offspring of Abraham, my friend. It's really... You know, well, Isaiah... Reflecting on who God is in relationship to Abraham, sees God as having a friend in Abraham. So fascinating. Yeah. Um, then James pitches in, mm -hmm. chapter 2, verse 23 of James, we have another mention of Abraham's friendship with God. Okay, so the context here is James, in James chapter 2, he's, he's writing about faith and works going together. And then in verse 23, he says, he comments, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Now Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me how familiar I am with the first part of that verse. He was count. He believed God and was, was counted, counted as righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a quote from Genesis 15. Yeah. But I'm not as familiar with the last part of that. Mm -hmm. And he was called God's friend. Yeah. Yeah. So there seems to be a relationship between his belief, between the effect 
of yeah. that faith and then the outcome of a friendship. Yeah. There. Yeah, that's very good. Very good point to bring out. Because in, in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham gets a lot of space as well in that one chapter. We call mm. it the Hall of Fame the hall, of yeah. the Saints. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. Abraham gets more press than the rest of them. Interesting. Right? And the, what stands out is by faith, by faith, by faith. By faith. Such Abraham, a prominent Abraham did, did part all of the story. Of these things. Yeah. 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 So apparently there is a tight relationship between the call of Abraham and his response by trusting what God is saying for him to do and friendship. Mm. Those calls and responses, those conversations, those actions yeah. are nurturing, yeah. it seems. A friendship. Yeah. Yeah. So the life of faith, then I'm jumping a little bit here. The life of faith then is a life of friendship. Mm. So what, what, what God calls us into uh, when he calls us to himself, come and be my friend. Mm. A life of faith is a life of friendship. friendship. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's not a transaction that you do at one time and then you set it aside until... One day you die and you go to heaven. Mm. But it, it's a friendship that you have with God all along. That, mm. you, that, you, that is constructed, that is built, that, that has so many elements to it. But, but God is actually mm. building that friendship with us mm. for us to become. So there's a, there's a formative effect of the friendship. It's, yeah. it's, uh, we'll, we'll get into that more as yeah. we go about when Jesus does come to the point when yeah. he's calling his disciples friends. Yeah. I want to say, I, George, I read the scriptures again. I mean, obviously, the, the, what I described a minute ago is my first reading. We, we had a conversation about that in the last few weeks, and, and um, you had already, had already cued me in you know, to these three verses. But, so I read them again after, after I was aware of those three, you know, I'm a good evangelical. Mm -hmm. So once I was aware that the Chronicles and Isaiah and James were all given interpretation of the narrative of Abraham through this understanding of friendship, and I read it again. And then I saw friendship all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know? funny how these things happen, like, yeah. Well, and in our next podcast, we're going to talk about the two... People who were on the road to Emmaus. Yeah. And we're going to look at it as, as like a paradigm of friendship. Okay. But that's not what it's about initially. Yeah. But once once you bring a prism to it, then you can you can see it. And uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. fascinating that way yeah. how how much there is in the scriptures. There really is. Yeah. And I'm not as optimistic as you are about our next podcast because I may need a couple just to talk about Abraham. We'll see. Uh, there's just so much there. But what's interesting here with Abraham is that his his faith is tied to this friendship with God. Yeah. Right. And uh, I think you know, growing up, Jim, like when you heard the language of faith, what did you internalize from that? Mm. What, what was this thing called faith? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was belief. Uh -huh. And I guess transfer of trust was a lot of the language. Mm -hmm. Said in different ways, but kind of a trust of my, the state of my condition, my soul, and my future was often what was kind of yeah. the ways I was thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's really good. I mean, that's definitely a part of faith, uh, belief. Um, sometimes we associate faith with professing something or being mm. having a conviction about something. Right, you know? yeah. Um, and those take us a certain way, but, uh, but there is a side to faith that is a lot more engaging of our commitments mm -hmm. to God, uh, looking at faith as loyalty, as um, allegiance, allegiance to God. 
Yeah. When we and when we have faith in God, when we enter into that relationship, we are making a pledge of allegiance, mm -hmm. and God is making a pledge of allegiance to us. Mm, that's good. And our friendship happens in that context of allegiance. Yeah. You mentioned an author the other day, um, Matthew somebody. Matthew Bates. Matthew Bates. Yeah, Matthew Bates uh, has, has actually written a book on this mm. uh, where he calls salvific faith, and he shows from the language of scriptures, and, and he does a, an excellent job on that, where the word faith actually needs to be translated allegiance. Mm. And Abraham committed to become allegiant to God, and that was to him a beautiful and a good thing mm. and the right way to live mm. with God, mm. to, be, to, to make God his sole allegiant king. Mm. Yeah. So there you go, George's amplified amplified version, version. yeah, yeah that's and good. Abraham believed God yeah. and it was accounted to him as righteousness that's good yeah yeah we'll we'll put that book title on the show notes too if you guys want to know more about that I mean what's interesting about faith is that we, we often think of it as happening inside your head right it's a belief it's things you have learned that you have come to believe to be true but um, whether you live that way or not is not necessarily tied to faith, mm. right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can believe a lot of things, and if you don't live them, you still have faith. Right. We think. Yeah. Right? But that's not how Jesus saw faith. Like, there is a passage in the New Testament in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Mm. I mean, the scene is very, very imaginative, if you want to see it in your mind's eye, where uh, four friends, yep. four people, I want to call them friends because that, that's where my mind goes automatically. Like they, They're picking up a guy on the side of the street okay. somewhere who is totally paralyzed. He's spent much of his life on a mat, probably begging. And they bring this person, this man, to where they discovered Jesus was going to be that night. And they, there's lots of people there. The room is crowded, mm -hmm. inside and outside. So they, they, they decide that, that they'd go up on the roof and dig the roof up and dangle this man in front of Jesus. <laughs> Evidently, there's no homeowners association no, at the time. No, yeah. I often wonder, like, who, who reconstructed the house? Yeah, you know? I have a few neighbors that would have something to say about. Yeah, they that. would. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think Jesus had more work to do the following day. You know, <laughs> putting that home back together. Yeah. But, but, it, so they did all this work, bring their friend from a distance. They came in last. They take him up to the roof, and you have to wonder, like, how do you take a lame person up to a flat right. roof yeah. when the stairs are basically this big Wow, around. really narrow. Yeah. yeah. They may have tied him up with their belt mm. ropes and, and got him up there. Yeah. And then they started taking the roof off. Huh. And yeah. uh, then they would have probably lied down on the roof tied the ropes around the edges of the mat and then dangle, dangled him in front of Jesus. Took a little time and effort. To, to, yeah, it's, it's a feat of engineering. Yeah. Like, Mordechai, you're going too fast. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm not quite there yet. I'm not yeah. as strong as you are. Yeah. But, but they bring him down to Jesus. Mm. And then when Jesus, it says, when he saw their faith. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So what he saw, them laboring, their allegiance to their friend, their loyalty to their wow. friend, yeah. he called that faith. Mm. And I think it's something like that with God, because Abraham came, seems like out of mm. nowhere, Ur of mm. the Chaldees, it's yeah. called, right? Um, and then he heard the call, the call 
to follow mm. God. Yeah. We're going to read that in a minute. Yeah. And then he jumps in. Yeah. So a friendship His loyalty begins. to God, his allegiance to God is the start of this friendship. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a great story from Mark II. We'll put the reference on the show notes as well. Um, so I think the, what we're going to do here, George, as we get started, is we're going to travel through Genesis 12 to 25. We're not going to read it all. In fact, we probably won't read very much of it. Yeah. But we will read a little here and there that will help guide us. Um, but we'll... We'll try to travel with it in such a way when we see friendship. We'll try to yeah. call that out. Yeah. And uh, and we would love for those of who, who are listening, if you have insights that we're missing, and I'm sure there are a plenty, shoot us an email. We'd love to hear them. We may be able to bring them, you know, up yeah. at some yeah, point. Yeah. And um, yeah. you can email us at uh, hello at soulrenovate.us. I believe that's the... No, it's info at soulrenovate.us. Yeah. That's the address. So so we're going to start back in Genesis. We'll see uh, before we get here in this first or, or in this particular episode. It's Genesis 12. I'd like to read just the first three verses. Yeah. Is that okay? Or would you like to read them? No. Okay. Well, you, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. You go ahead. Okay. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 says, the Lord said to Abram, that's his name at the beginning, go out from your country, your relatives, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Then I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will exemplify divine blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but the ones who treat you lightly I must curse, so that all the families of the earth may receive blessing through you. So you just mentioned that this began with a call, yeah, and that was yeah. the early words of the call. And I think that, you know, my my first reflection on that was God starts this yeah. here mm-hmm. in this case. Correct. I don't know it would matter who started it, but God definitely is the one who yeah. took the initiative. Yeah. Here with with Abraham, I think it could have started the other way with Abraham crying out yeah. to heaven and God responding, but it started with God. You know, I'm I'm curious. You know, there is a parallel to this. Like this is what Jesus did too. He called his disciples mm. to be a blessing Good. to the nations. Like yeah. you can sandwich Matthew that way, right? Um, yeah, Matthew the tax collector. Ma- yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. Uh, come, come, I, I'm going, you're going to walk with me. You're going to do this walk of faith. You're going to live this faith life with me Yeah. Uh, as, as my friends. Yeah. And then I'm going to make you a blessing to the nation. Yeah, that's good. That's Matthew 28, 18 to yeah, 20, right? That's right. Yeah. There's some strength in this, um, I think it's good to use the word command. You know, God's mm-hmm. coming to Abraham and say, go. And it's coming. In the, he's already moved once. His father had displaced the family to Ur. And, uh, and now, as Abraham is an older man now, I think he's around, I don't remember exactly, around 85 or so. It's 75 at this 75, point. 75, is that what it is? And um, God is telling him, go and depart and leave this place you're familiar yeah. with, yeah, and and go to a, he doesn't name it, yeah, and to go to a place I'll show you, yeah, <laughs> and uh, so there's some uncertainty, well, you know, Jim, from like the get go, he's asking him to immigrate, right, yeah, uh, to a place, I, I'll show you when you get there, oh man, like, yeah, but, yeah. but the uh, the the complexities of immigrating from where you grew up. Hmm. 
all the things that are familiar to you, yeah. to a new place, to a new land. Yeah. You know, it's it's amazing. You 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 put me on to a movie. Uh, it's called The Good Lie. Right, The Good, the Good Lie. Lie. Yeah. It's about the Wonderful. lost the lost boys of Sudan. Yes. Right. And their experience escaping that horror, being refugees in Kenya, and then immigrating to the U.S. Yeah. And what that immigrant life looks like, feels like. So I think uh, Abraham is going to a place where there's a new language. There are new traditions. Yeah. There are new ways of doing business. There's, he's going to an established area where uh, life is happening, the culture is happening, and he's yeah. going to learn all of that. Yeah. So he needs, he needs God to walk with him. Yeah. And the promise that God made to him is so sustaining to him. Hmm. Well, we'll get into that. That's yeah. good. So sustaining. Yeah. So, George, you've done this. You immigrated. I immigrated. Yeah. Um, I immigrated in 1969. Like, this is an age ago. Yeah. Most of my life has not been lived, not in my country of birth, Lebanon. I was, yeah, I was 19. Yeah, 19. I'm 75 now, so, like, this is 56 years later. <laughs> wow. So, do you remember, I'm, I'm sure you do, you were 19, yeah. some of the the complexities that yeah, yeah. of language, one, one day we'll probably get into that story a little bit more okay. uh, yeah. in detail when, when the time comes, but but it, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. I did not. I was not able to speak a word of English. Yeah. Honestly, I could not. The only, we used to listen to uh, English television from America, and The Untouchables was mm. one of the first shows I remember. Yeah. So kind of my ears got attuned to English that yeah. way. But like I would pronounce words like businessmen mm -hmm. as business man. Because <laughs> that's how... I thought the language was built, you yeah. know, like you've got these vowels and an I is an I, so it's buzinous, man. You know, you, Makes sense to me. So you have to, yeah. the language, the culture. Yeah. I remember the uh, first apple I crunched into in the West. Uh, I thought I was eating straw. Like, I said, what is this? <laughs> like, it didn't taste anything like an apple I grew up with. Okay. But anyway, that blows yeah. are. Okay, so... We'll, so, so you just to promise. show you that, yeah. you know, it, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Like yeah. he's leaving home, he's leaving traditions, and he's saying to God, you're going to make me a people that people are going to want to be with me. Mm. And I'm supposed to be a blessing. Like this is not a transaction that's happening here. God is calling him to something really intimate really, uh, it becomes a common thing between them. Say a little bit more about transaction. You said this is not a transaction. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, he is making a covenant with Abraham. Mm. And uh, a covenant where he's, he's promising faithfulness to the very end. Mm. And Abraham is receiving this as a promise. That's really good because... I think it's my tendency to think of covenant sort of like a contract. But already as I'm reflecting on the passage we just read, there, what God is saying to him, to him, normally when you sign a contract with someone, you don't say, I will bless you. You know, it's, it's, there's just not that level of intimacy in the contract. It's yeah. more you fulfill your duty and I'll fulfill mine. Yeah, yeah. You know. No, no, the, the call is, uh, I will bless you. I will, I will be what you need. I will be walking with you. I will be, uh, I will tell you things mm -hmm. that the world needs to know, but I will tell you things about yourself, and I will teach you things about yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to discover a lot of things in this walk with mm -hmm. me, so... I see it as a call to something much bigger, but at least at the 
at the relationship level between Abraham and God, it's a call to friendship. Yeah. You can see the seed of it yeah. when you think about yeah. it that way. It's not that hard. I mean, we're still asking the question, on what basis did the chroniclers and Isaiah and James call this a friendship? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah. the call must have been initially a call to friendship. Mm-hmm. When they describe Abraham as a friend of God, that's yeah. We have and, to look and, at it in we, that way. Yeah, and we hear the strength in the in the call. We hear that both this, we both hear the call to obedience, go. Yeah. But we also hear the promise, you know, of commitment to Him. So when when you think about this, for lack of a better way, dance that's here between obedience and blessing. Yeah. It's really hard to stay in a contractual way of understanding that very long. True, yeah. yeah. You know, it's not a it's not a friendship of equals. Obviously. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. But we have friendships that are not friendships of of equal. Mm-hmm. Um, not our friendship necessarily. But Unless we, we're playing table tennis. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> trust me, <laughs> we've never played table tennis, yeah. nor do I plan to play you anytime soon. Yeah. But, but yeah. yeah, so th- there is a call to obedience in this friendship, yeah. and it is uh, for the benefit of the vision and mission of God in the world, yeah. but it's also for our own benefit. Yeah, that's good. As personal friends of yeah. God. Right? And that's one thing I want to, not, not this minute, but I want to explore that obedience component a little bit yeah. more yeah. with you as it re- relates not, not only to our friendship with God, but as friends with each other, mm-hmm. uh, human friendships, because I think there's something there I want to I want to poke yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Abraham goes, um, and he begins traveling, and it the, as the scriptures tell the story, there's stages along the way. He he stops sometimes at a place and hangs that out there. Sometimes he'll build an altar. When he gets there, he'll he'll stop and he'll worship yeah. and build an altar. And often we're not really told much more, but it's very relational. Mm-hmm. This cycle of worshiping, remembering, marking. Uh, it almost reminds me of my son and his friends going on a retreat. You know, they're like marking something together. Mm-hmm. You know. And uh, a famine takes him to Egypt. Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll start landing the plane here. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. let's let's do this before we uh, do so. A famine takes him to Egypt, and one of the first things we find him doing in Egypt is lying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not a pretty moment for yeah. Abraham. And and those who told us he's a friend of God know this. <laughs> they know this story. It's they're not. A, yeah, yeah. They, they know it, and they would maintain that in the midst of that relationship, there is a friendship that is going on between God and Abraham. Yeah. So we we have to deal with that. We do, yeah. and you can read the story if you want. Since cha- we're not going to read it, no. it's in chapter twelve, uh, verses eleven to twenty. Uh, but he does lie, although it. It it kind of falls in. We'll get into this later because it's not it's not the only time this happens, but it's a little bit more or less than a lie, depending on how you want to look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but he does, and I cannot imagine being Sarah, his wife, when he does, because it yeah. puts her in a really, yeah. really vicarious and awkward position. Jim, from your reading of of the Genesis account recently of Abraham. Do you sense that Abraham felt that he is a friend of God? Boy. Like, I'm, ju- I'm just curious here. Like, mm-hmm. what does it feel like? What did it feel like for Abraham? Because people yeah. labeled him a friend of God. Yeah. That's he a great question. He is a friend of God. And then Isaiah tells us God calls Abraham my friend. Yeah. Right? But how did Abraham feel... A sense of friendship hmm. with God. I I could make a almost make a case from both sides. I think at times I, I'm not seeing it when I'm reading, but then if I stop and really be with it and ask myself, 
What exactly is Abraham? Because there's a number of times Abraham's being pretty bold with God. Yeah. And put, yeah. Uh, almost to the point of pushing what, what we might call pushing back. Uh-huh. Not necessarily irreverently. He's not mm. shaking his fist to the sky. But, but you know, after, when I read it again, after we talked about those texts that call him a friend, then one of my thoughts was, well, this is what f- really, when there's a f- trust in a relationship, a friend is not a f- so afraid to go to the mat with his friend. That's right. Yeah. You know? That's right. And say, this seems unreasonable. Or, yeah. or whatever. Still in the context of honesty and frankness and yeah. love and respect, there's freedom to talk about these things that you think you might disagree with. Yeah. That you're commanded to do. Yeah. Yeah, in the midst of all the obedience, it's, e- it's easy for me to read the Abraham story as seeing God's giving commands and Abraham's obeying mm-hmm. or a few times not, yeah. you know. But... I think there's a lot more to the story. I think there's a lot more depth. Yeah. I think the story's a lot more layered than that. Well, maybe we can land this thing and uh, yeah, and continue the conversation because we're just scratching the surface here. We're getting started. That's all right. I think I think there's benefit here from considering the story of Abraham as a story of friendship. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll see you next time. Yeah. See okay. you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Soul Renovate podcast. Any of the scriptures or resources that we mentioned in this episode will be linked in our show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a review and subscribe on your favorite podcasting app because it really helps us to share these conversations with more Christian leaders like you. And if you have any questions you'd like Jam and George to answer, you can email us at info at soulrenovate.us. Soul Renovate is a ministry of Christ First Counseling Center, and it exists to propel Christian leaders to abide in Christ and grow in His likeness. Soul Renovate is made possible by the generous support of people like you. If you'd like to support us, you can do that on our website, soulrenovate.us. And if you'd like to learn more about Soul Renovate, you can also do that on our website, soulrenovate.us. This podcast is produced by me, Dalton Huey, with the help of Gil Hara. Our cover art was designed by Hannah Huey, and our music is by The Fox's Forest. Thanks again for listening. Till next time.